there, those of you online, welcome. It's going to be a great day inside of the house of the Lord. Come on, let's sing together. When all I see is goodbye, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see.
the God of the breakthrough. I love the, the words that we're singing there is, God, I'm gonna praise you before the breakthrough. So many times we wanna shout and praise after the breakthrough, but you know what faith is? Faith in Hebrews 11, chapter six, is coming to God and believing who He is. And as you seek Him, as you press into Him, as you worship Him, as you lean into Him, Hebrews 11:6 6 says, and God rewards those who diligently seek Him. See, faith is before the breakthrough this morning. And so today we got some people, we got two praise reports that are really great. Someone praising God for a successful surgery and we, we prayed over that one. And there's a really great one here of a, a, a mother-daughter that six years of broken relationship and last week God brought them together and uh, there's healing. And I love that because it kind of ties in a little bit on what I'm going to talk about today. And then we got so many prayer cards that came in. Someone's having a surgery tomorrow. Someone's believing for, for a son who is struggling with depression. There's someone here believing for a husband who does not know Jesus and they come to salvation. And there are so many prayer cards. And thank you again for filling these in because our team, we're going to pray over these, the staff on Tuesday. And this is going to go out to all our intercessors this week that are going to be praying and believing for, for breakthroughs for your life because we serve the God of the breakthrough. Maybe today you didn't fill out a card, but there's something on your heart right now. I'm going to ask you to put your, your hand on your heart online. You can do this too right now in this moment. I believe that God's limited, not limited by ge geography. He's, he's with you right now in your room. And I believe that as you put your hand on your heart in faith, that God's going to touch you too. I'm going to ask you to stretch out your other hand towards me. And this is just a sign of agreement. There's power when we come together. The Bible says we two or more agree concerning anything. It will be done for them. And so we're going to agree today as a family. When we come together and praise a family, there's a, what the Bible says, a corporate anointing. There's an anointing and we come together and we're in this atmosphere of worship in the presence of God. So let's pray together. Father, we want to lift up today every prayer card, God. Every card is a life that needs a breakthrough. I want to lift up every hand that's on our hearts. So many hands that are on hearts this morning. I believe not just here, but online as well, God. 
I thank you that you know what we're facing right now and what we're going through. And so our hands and our heart is surrendering to you. We're believing today that you are the God of breakthrough. Lord, we believe for these cards for successful surgery tomorrow. God, for that husband who doesn't know you to, to bow his heart and come to realize that you're a good and you're a faithful God. God, for that young man who's struggling with depression, God, and all the other cards you know in every hands and heart. And so, God, in this moment, we thank you that we come before you because Hebrews chapter four tells us that we have a high priest who understands what we're going through. We have a king a shepherd, a priest, Jesus, who knows what we're going through. And so we come before you today and we thank you that we'll find grace, we'll find your favor in the time of need. So God, I thank you today for answered prayers. I thank you for breakthroughs. I thank you for healings, for successful surgeries, for husbands coming to salvations, for kids being restored. And so we give you all the honor. We give you all the praise because you're a good and loving God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. in yours this morning. Thank you that you have a purpose and you have a plan for this morning. I pray that you will soften our hearts and our ears to hear as you speak with us this morning. God, but thank you for this morning that we can worship you. What an honor, what an honor, what an honor. We bless you this morning in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, we praise the Lord one more time. You can go ahead and be seated. And uh, so good to be with you this morning. Such a sweet presence of the Lord that's here this morning. And uh, glad to uh, be with you this morning. If this is your first time at Mountain Park Church, we're so honored that you would join us on your Sunday morning. And if you're logging in for the first time too, welcome to our online family. Uh, so glad. I believe my folks have logged in this morning from South Africa. And so shout out to mom and dad. Uh, love it. They love to log in and do church with you. 
And uh, if this is your first time and you're here this morning, please make sure you stop by our new here, start here tent located outside the lobby. We've got a little gift, a little bag for you. And so get your little gift bag, meet the team there. They would love to meet you. Again, we're so honored that, uh, that you would join us on your Sunday. Hey, don't forget, uh, Life Journals are on sale. And I know uh, we're, uh, I think we've got over close to 400 people that have already bought the Life Journal. And so that's really exciting that uh, people are jumping into the Word of God. And as I shared with this Life Journal that, you know, if you just do it once a week, that's 52 days, right? No? Uh, yeah, yeah, 52. I think something like that. My math's all messed up. Uh, I'm, uh, and so make sure you get the journal. And I guarantee you, if you do just one day a week, it's more than you did the year before. You do two days a week. I mean, then you, you're just getting into it. And so, you know, man shall not live by bread alone is what Scripture says. And it's so important to be in the Word of God. And this is a great, great tool. Uh, you can pick it up in the lobby at the white marble table and get your journal, and then um, also a lot of great things happening up. I wanna highlight a few things before the message that are very, very important. And the first is the next weekend is our birthday party. Mountain, Mountain Park is 35 years old. And so, uh, how, and let me see, raise a hand. How many were you were here 35 years ago? Mountain Park, 35 years ago. Okay, yep, anybody else? Yep, oh wow, okay. Anybody else? 30, yep, awesome. So next year, 35 years, you got all the stories on you about the church. And, uh, and so we're going to have fun next, uh, next weekend. And we got some birthday cake. And there's a lot of other things that's going to be fun. I don't want to give it away. So make sure you get to church next weekend. And, you know, it's more than just celebrating uh, a birthday. Uh, it's celebrating the goodness of God that God has been with Mountain Park from the beginning and that God is leading this church. And so it's not just about celebrating a birthday, it's about celebrating God's goodness at Mountain Park Church. So invite someone to, invite someone to church. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I've got a fun message prepared. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not a heavy one. This morning's gonna be a heavy one. Next week's gonna be a fun one. And so you're like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm, I'm disconnecting. No, stay online, church. And so uh, it's gonna be fun. Also then, if you're a leader at Mountain Park, and what does that mean? You, you lead a small group, you, you, uh, you, you're on stage, or you're involved in a ministry, and uh, our lead at Mountain Park training day is coming up. Up, and that's happening on October the 22nd, Saturday from 9 to about 1. It's a very important uh, uh, day. Mark it on your calendar. And uh, we have lunch provided. You need to register online. We have, we have lunch and everything. And really what we're going to do is uh, we're going to elevate, you know, lead. We're going to train leaders at Mountain Park Church. We, our DNA series I spoke about, we need disciples and make disciples and make disciples. We need leaders over leaders. And so this is how we're going to begin to jump in. What does leadership look like at Mountain Park Church? And so if you're a leader servant, we want you to be at lead uh, at lead on October 22nd. Uh, then also, uh, this is a fun one that, that I'm excited about with the marriage ministry. We have an incredible marriage uh, team, ministry team here. On October, uh, November the 4th and 5th is our Art of Marriage mini conference. And so it's a Friday night, Saturday morning, and uh, it goes to about three. We got childcare. And uh, this literally takes a nine-week course and does it in two days. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing course. I've done this at about three churches. And, uh, and it, so let me tell you something. You might say, well, my marriage is not in a mess. You know what? My, my, my car, it needs an oil change. It's not in a mess. But if I don't do an oil change, what happens to my car? It's going to become a mess. That's good, babe. And so Art of Marriage is, it's a, it just helps you to be better communication. It helps you to get some tools. And it doesn't matter. I, you know, I once did this in Chicago. Uh, we had 50 couples that came. And there was a couple that were married for 52 years. And they loved each other. They were like in, involved in the church. They were planted in the church. And they said to me, they wrote me a handwritten card and said, this course is taking our marriage to the next level. And I'm like, you've been married 53 years. I mean, how many levels are there, you know? And so, but this course is for everybody. So if you're a married couple, I want to challenge you to sign up, come to this. I believe it's a great way to go into the holiday season because it's always one of the times where families begin, there's a lot of tension and it's a way to set up next year and to really see God flourish in your marriage. So uh, mark your calendar for that. Again, you can register online. If you have questions, our team will be uh, over in the group up just jumping area, you go out the doors and to your left, some people that will answer any questions you have. 
Well, let's jump into the Word today. Last, last week, uh, Alyssa kicked us off with uh, week one of our new series, Inside Story. And this, story, this series, what we're going to do is we're going to look at different characters in the Bible. We're going to look at their story and how their story speaks into our story. Because our stories are so important to God. And today we're going to talk about the power of forgiveness. And we're going to look at a man in the Bible who had every reason not to forgive. Every reason to be bitter. Every reason to be angry. Every reason to seek vengeance. You know, the reality about life is life is made up of relationships. You can't avoid people. You literally would have to go find a cave in the middle of nowhere and hide out. But then the problem is you're going to need food. And someone's going to have to bring you food. So there's going to be a relational interaction. Life is about so much about relationships. And here's one thing we know is that in life, you're going to have disappointments. You're going to have betrayals. You're going to have people say things about you behind your back. You're going to have fans. You're going to have friends. And you're going to have frenemies. That's a new word. Frenemies. I don't even know what it means. Go Google it. A friend that becomes an enemy, I guess. But we all go through it. Hurt people hurt people. And so often, a bad experience or a bad encounter, something from the past, can wound us so much that it affects the trajectory of our lives. Today, we're going to look at a man in the Bible. His name is Joseph. And if there's anybody that had a reason to seek vengeance, it was Joseph. You know, Joseph's story is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 37. It's where the story starts. And we see that Joseph uh, was the favorite son of his dad. In fact, his dad made him a robe with different colors and and uh, he just loved his son. And, and Joseph's brothers were not happy. They were very angry, jealous of Joseph. And Joseph, he has a dream. He has a dream of, of these bundles of, of grain, that the 11 bundles that came and they bowed down to the one. And he realized that that dream was his brothers bowing down to him. So he goes to his brothers and says, hey, guys, I had a dream. It's a dream of God. It's amazing. Here's, the, here's what my dream's about. You're all going to bow down to me. How do you think the brothers felt about that? And then he has a second dream about the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowing down. And then so he, then he goes and tells his brothers, he goes, and his dad and his mom, he says, you won't believe this dream. God, God spoke to me. It was amazing. And they're like, wow, what was the dream? Dad, you're going to bow down to me. Mom, you're going to bow down to me. Brothers, you're going to bow down to me. You know, side note, be careful who you share your dreams with. Because Joseph's brothers were not happy. In fact, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. His own blood, flesh and blood, wanted to kill him, his brothers. And one of the brothers says, no, no, let's not kill him. Let's sell him as a slave. And so his brothers sell him as a slave. I mean, think about that. They wanted to kill him, and then they sold him. Imagine the pain that he must have felt, because the dream he had was not an ego, that he, ego chase he was after, or I'm better than you. The dream he had came from God. Yeah. He was just sharing what God told him. And so off he goes. I could imagine him just being sold as a slave, and his, his brothers are high-fiving each other. They're so excited. The problem child is gone. Woo-hoo! No more dealing with Joseph. And he's looking back, and he's seeing... I might never see my brothers again. And he's sold as a slave into Egypt and he ends up in the house of a, of a powerful man named Potiphar. And he works in Potiphar's house and God's favor is on Joseph and everything that Joseph touched literally turns to gold in a sense. And Potiphar becomes wealthy and his estate gets larger and, and, and he just empowers Joseph. There's something on you. I don't know what it is. It must be your God or whatever. And he gives him more power and more authority and, and Joseph is just going up the ladder and, and, and he, eventually he becomes the, the, the highest leader in Potiphar's house. He runs everything. But Joseph was good looking and Potiphar's wife, she kind of noticed him and she began to flirt with him. She began to send him text messages. You're so fine, you're so fine, you should be mine. <laughs> and Joseph's like, stay away from me, woman. But one day he's alone in the house with her, and she's like, Joseph, Joseph. And she's like, you need, to, you, need to, you need to sleep with me. 
And what does Joseph do? He runs. And then what does she do? She says, she accuses him of rape. And then Joseph, guess what? He's falsely accused. He gets sent to prison. I mean, he just tried to do his best. He tried to reestablish his life in a sense, working for Potiphar. Everything was going great. And he's falsely accused. He didn't do it. And he ends up in prison. But you know what happened in prison is, again, God's favor was on Joseph's life. And eventually he gets to the place in the prison with a warden and just says, Joseph, you can run the prison. And two guys get thrown into prison, a cupbearer, the king's cupbearer, and the king's baker. And these two guys have a dream. And so they come to Joseph. Hey, we had a dream. No one can help us. And Joseph's going, okay, tell me the dream. And so they share the dream with him. And he interprets and he says to the baker, here's the deal. In three days, you're going to go out of prison and you're going to be, you're going to be killed. You're going to die. The king's going to order your execution. The cupbearer he says, hey, in three days, you're going to be restored to serving the king, his cup. And he says to the cupbearer, here's the deal, though. Please don't forget about me. I mean, hey, I hooked you up with an interpretation. We're BFFs, come on. And what happens? Three days later, the cupbearer is restored. The baker is executed. And the cupbearer, what does he do? Hey, I need to hook up Joseph. He interpreted, I need to go get a hold of Joseph. He was right. No, the cupbearer forgets about Joseph for two years. I mean, you just help someone out, and they forget about you. You're in the prison. They promise to remember you. They forget about you. How would you feel? For two years he sat there, and then Pharaoh has a dream. He's like, ah, no one can interpret. He brings in all his magicians, all his wise men. No one can interpret the the dream. And the cupbearer stops and goes, this feels familiar. (laughs) I remember I had a dream. (gasps) Joseph. (laughs) Hey, Joseph's still alive? Can someone go get Joseph? I don't know what, is he dead? Is he two years later? And Joseph's brought before Pharaoh. And we know the story. Joseph interprets the king, Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh says, is there anybody in Egypt as wise as Joseph? Is there anybody whose God is like Joseph's? And what does he do? He takes off his signet ring and he gives it to Joseph. And he makes Joseph the prime minister, the second most powerful man in Egypt. He went from the prison to the palace. But we're going to pick up the story today in Genesis chapter 45, verse 4 to 8. Because there was a famine in the land. Joseph said to Pharaoh, seven years, we're going to have plenty, and we need to save those crops. We need to store it up, because after the seven years of plenty, there's going to be seven years of drought. And Joseph's brothers are are hearing about Egypt and this food, and in verse 45, then Joseph said to his brothers, they come before him, they stand before him, they don't know it's Joseph. Come close to me, Joseph said, and then when he had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. I mean, can you just picture a drum roll there? Like, they didn't recognize Joseph. They they, they try to kill him. They sold him into slavery. The year that Egypt has food and that they can go to Egypt, their dad sends him, says, go to Egypt. I hear there's food. Maybe you can buy food or negotiate a trade. And so, yeah, they're standing before Joseph. He knows who they are. They don't know who he is. And he says, come a little closer. And they're like, wow, this prime minister really likes us. And they're coming a little closer. And then he goes, I am Joseph. I'm your brother. Imagine the fear, knees rattling. Blame. It was him. It wasn't me. It was him. No, no, no. <laughs> but what does Joseph do in verse 5? And now, do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there have been famine in the land. And for the next five years, they will not be plowing and reaping. He's saying that this famine is going to last another five years. But listen to verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Can we just stop there and say, wow. These are the guys that try to kill him. 
disowned him, sent him off, sold him. They got money for their own brother. All these years. And what does Joseph say to them? It's okay, guys. It was God. It was God that sent me ahead. It was God that sent me ahead to save you. You try to kill me. It was God's plan to use me to save you. In verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. What was Joseph's secret? Why would he not say, you know what? Vengeance is mine. God, hold on. I got this. I mean, I have played the tape over and over in my mind when I was being taken away as a slave. Oh, I'm going to get him. When I was accused of rape, which I didn't do, man, it's my brother's fault that I'm here. When I sat in the prison and I interpreted dreams, I'll remember you, brother. I got you. I'm going to hook you up. For two years, in two years, he waited. Imagine what could have been going on in his mind. But he says to his brothers, it was not you who sent me here, but God. What was the secret? How did Joseph get to this place of forgiving? How could he get to this place of saying, you know what? I'm not going to look in the natural at the pain and the betrayal and the disappointment. I'm not going to look down at it. I'm going to look up at God. It was not you who sent me here, but God. How could he see God in the midst of the pain and the betrayal and the false accusations? How could he see that in the midst of promises that were never fulfilled by people? Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. God, I don't understand why they did it. I don't understand why she said that. I don't understand why he forgot me in the prison cell. I don't understand why people have not followed through or loved me or accepted me. I don't understand, but I know this, you're in control. I know this, God, you're holding me. I might not understand, but I know this, you're working it all out for me, God. You see, a lot of people think that For Joseph, the closure moment came when his brothers stood before him. When his brothers stood there, he could literally say in that moment, okay, God, I choose to forgive them. I have now faced my enemy. I have now faced my pain. I have now faced my rejection. Because his brothers were there. But if you want to understand and see how Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. You've got to back up a few chapters. You've got to go back to Genesis chapter 41, verse 50 to 52. And before the years of the famine came, Joseph is now a prime minister, seven great years. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, Basisnath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And listen to verse 51. He named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. And in verse 52, and the second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Some of you need to catch this. It wasn't when his brothers stood before him that he had closure. It was all the way back, seven years before, nine years before his brothers showed up, that Joseph came to this realization that God, you are sovereign. That Joseph came to this, this place in his life of trusting God and saying, God, I don't understand why my brothers and my father, why they did this to me, why they allowed this, why no one came. Why did my dad not come and look for me? Why, why did he just believe I was dead? There must have been something inside of him knowing that I'm still alive. And, and why has no one come? And here I am. I've gone through all this, this pain and disappointment and suffering in life. But he says this. He said, God, I trust you. 
You are sovereign. You're in control. It doesn't matter what has gone on in my life or what's going to come. God, you've got it. And so he names his first son, Manasseh, which we read there means this. God, you have made me forget. And if you study the word forget there in the Hebrew, it literally means forgive. It literally means putting it on and sending it out never to come back. He literally says, God, you have brought me to this place of all this pain, all this unforgiveness, all this heartache, heartache that I've gone through. And God, you have caused me to forget. It's like it never happened. And his second son, Ephraim, he says, God, you have made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Joseph did what? He said, God, you made me forget. And because I trusted you in helping me to forgive and to let it go, that that forgiveness that I released opened the door to your blessing in my life. And God, you've made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. You see, when you hold on to unforgiveness, you know what it does. It stops the blessing and favor of God in your life. It stops your destiny and your future. You see, what Joseph, in a sense, was saying, well, why is this so important? Because when Joseph named Manasseh and named Ephraim, he was declaring or prophesying or speaking his future. He was literally saying, over my legacy and future, unforgiveness will not have a root. And forgiveness will not have a place. In my future, my future, my kids are going to be blessed, not held back by unforgiveness. You see, there's some of you today, you're held back by the sins and the unforgiveness from your dad, your mom, your uncle, things that have gone on. And those things have defined who you are. But Joseph said, no, no, no. Pain will not define who I am. Who defines who I am today is God Almighty. Come on, some of you need to get a little excited this morning. It doesn't matter what you've gone through, what has been done to you, who has said what about you, who has betrayed you, neglected you, forgotten about you, robbed you, cheated you. It doesn't matter. God has made me forgive. And God has made me fruitful. I'm not letting unforgiveness. Let me give you three things really quickly about unforgiveness. Why holding on to unforgiveness is so dangerous for your life. Number one, unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness to grow in your heart. Unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness to grow in our hearts. We can't hang on to unforgiveness. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 to 15. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see God. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Saying, come on, realize this, that Jesus is the manifestation of the grace of God. God so loved you, he sent his son to take your sin and brokenness on a cross that you could receive forgiveness and be a new creation, as Paul says, in Christ Jesus. But he says, don't take it for granted. And let what? No bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. Paul's writing here saying, or the, the, the author of Hebrews is saying, come on, watch out. Watch out for unforgiveness because unforgiveness will put in a root of bitterness. My favorite verse, and you should know it by now, Proverbs 4, verse 23, guard your heart above all else. Why? It determines the course of your life. You know what unforgiveness wants to do? It wants to come into your heart and plant a root there. And you know what roots do? They go down, and then a tree comes with fruit. See, unforgiveness will make you bitter and angry and sarcastic and judgmental and critical. It'll make you gossip and say things and think the worst of everybody. When people come into your life, you're going to need to say, hey, what's their motive? What's their MO? You can't just let them love you. You're always critical. You're looking for people to fail you. There it is. I knew they would let me down. Listen, none of us are perfect. We're going to let each other down. But our security is not relationships with each other. Our security is God. Is God who holds me together. Yes. Second thing, why don't hold on to, why should I not hold on to unforgiveness is not just a root of bitterness, but number two, unforgiveness opens the door to the enemy in our lives. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 10 and 11, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ, Paul writes, for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us. 
for we must, we are not unaware of his schemes. And Paul, right now in the church of Corinth in this moment, was a man who had caused tremendous sin and pain in the church. And people were like, kick him out. There was so much bitterness and anger. And what does Paul do as the father of the church? He says this, I forgive him. I'm not holding it against him and neither should you. He says, if we hold on to unforgiveness, Paul writes, we're opening the door for Satan to come in. And he would love to come in and cause havoc amongst each other. But Paul says, I, I forgive him. Unforgiveness opens the door to the enemy. And come on, the enemy, if you're a believer today, there's nothing more the enemy wants to do than to get into your heart. And one of the ways he does it is unforgiveness. So number one is unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness. Unforgiveness opens the door to the enemy. And number three, to me, it's so important. Unforgiveness grieves the spirit of God. It grieves the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30 to 31. Do not grieve the Holy, the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Paul, Paul's writing here and saying, come on, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christ follower today and you believe in Jesus, you have been made righteous through his work on the cross, his death and resurrection. You are a child of God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God is in your life. And you know what? Sometimes when we get that yucky, eggy feeling, when we say something about somebody, we're like, ooh, I didn't feel good, but I just said something ugly about someone, what is it? That's the Holy Spirit, you're grieving him. It's the presence of God. He doesn't, God doesn't condemn, he convicts. He says, come on, let that go. Why? Because unforgiveness will produce fruit in your life. It'll stop you from being the best you. It'll hold you back. So what does forgiveness look like? I wanna give you three practical steps today about what does forgiveness look like? Pastors are just a God forgive me, let me move on. No, it's deeper than that. What does forgiveness look like? Number one, forgiveness. Forgiveness is releasing your resentment toward that offender. God, I'm gonna, this resentment, this anger I have to that person, God, I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna give it to you, God. You know what's so beautiful about the cross? The cross is the place that we can go to and we can unload everything at the foot of the cross. See, when we, when we bow our hearts at the cross, we see that Jesus paid the price for our forgiveness and that he loved us in the midst of our sin and our brokenness and the times where we denied him and pushed him aside and the times where we weren't obedient and we did our own selfish things, yet he forgave us and we can bring this pain to the foot of the cross and say, thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes that I am healed and that I can give this to you. You see, unforgiveness doesn't mean, well, you know what, child, they're just gonna, they just, that means they just get away with it. No, you know what, when you begin to say, I'm taking this unforgiveness and I'm choosing to forgive, I'm releasing this resentment to God. You know what you're doing? You're literally saying, God, they, they're off my hook, but I'm putting them onto yours. God, you're gonna deal with it. Whatever consequences, whatever needs to happen, it's yours. But I need to walk in my freedom. I need to walk in my joy. I need to walk in my peace. I'm tired of every time when they cross my path, I, I wanna run. I'm tired of the thoughts that play in my mind. I'm tired of the coldness in my heart, God. I don't wanna live that way. I'm, I am putting it at the cross. I, I'm releasing this resentment. I'm giving it to you, God, and I'm, you, you will deal with them however you want to, God. But I'm giving it to you. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, do not repay any evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Paul, Paul's writing here saying, come on, let it go. Give it to God. He's greater than you. He works in ways that you cannot see. Trust him, but don't repay evil. When that person comes, psh, do you, psh, 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 psh. let me talk, did you, did you know? Psh, yeah. Psh, look at them raising their hands in church, trying to worship God. Psh, if you only knew. If you, girlfriend, if you knew. <laughs> yeah, look at them on the video on the screen. Look at them on stage. Look at them leading a small group. Psh, I know, I know, I got the info. 
No, you shouldn't be sitting with any info because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, a holy God. There should be no bitterness or anger or rage or jealousy or evil in your heart. You need to take your heart to the cross. Say, God, I'm giving this to you. I don't want a root of bitterness in my life. I don't want to open the door to the enemy. I want to be like Joseph and say, you have made me fruitful in the land of my suffering, God. You have made me fruitful. You have blessed my life and you're working it all out for me, God. It doesn't matter what they accused me of. It doesn't matter what they did to me. My eyes are on you, God. Who can stand before you, God? No one. I trust in your sovereignty. So number one, release your resentment toward toward the offender. Number two, release your rights regarding the offense. God, the only right I have is to praise you. The only right I have is to be grateful that you chose me, God. The only right right I have is that you forgave me. That's the rights I have. The only rights I have is to pray for them, to bless those that curse me. God, I want to release my rights to be offended, God. I'm not going to bring it up anymore. I'm not going to be like when I see them in my mind go, you owe me. Yeah, you owe me. I'm not going to make them feel bad every time they get around me, guilty and shameful. No, no, God. I'm choosing to forgive today. I'm, I'm releasing that resentment, God. I'm, I'm releasing the right. I'm giving it to you because you've got me in your hands. You saw it. You knew it was gonna come my way, just like Joseph. Joseph knew God made me go through this. Yes. It was not you, brothers. It was God that made me go through it. Proverbs chapter 17, verse nine says, whoever fosters love covers an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. I'm releasing my rights to bring us up again. I'm not bringing it up and again. I'm tired of that email, that text message, that that hate mail that I got, that hate text. You know what I'm gonna do today? I'm gonna delete it. It's not gonna be a bullet in my gun. Yeah, I'm waiting for the time when we're going to get together and have a blow up. I'm going to show you that email you sent me. I'm going to hold that text against you. No, 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 no. I'm, uh, I'm giving up all my rights because I'm trusting God. I'm going to trust God. Release the, re- the resentment. Release the rights. And number three, the most important, forgiveness is reflecting the character of Christ. You know what forgiveness is about? It's about realizing that God forgave you before you even reached out to him. It's realizing that God so loved you that he sent Jesus. When God looked upon us in humanity, he saw our sin and our selfishness and our brokenness. You know, God could have said, you know what? Let's wait till one day they come before my throne And I'm just going to sit there and go, sinner, sinner, sinner. Yeah, you all sinned. I did so much for you and you sinned. You'll no longer be in my presence. But God so loved us, he could look past our sin and our selfishness, our brokenness. Jesus says the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. He could look past that in our lives and forgive us. How much more then can we forgive the people we see? Realizing that they're broken in so many ways, just like us. Realizing that they need God just as much as we do. See, forgiveness is being more like Jesus. It's saying, I've freely received grace and now I live it out. I receive grace, now I live it out. I've I've released the resentment to you, God. I've released my rights to you, God. I've emptied, there's no root of bitterness anymore. There's no door that's open for the enemy. 
And I've done this because I'm your temple. So God, come fill me with peace. Come fill me with joy. Come and make me like Joseph, fruitful in the land of my suffering. I want to close today with Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Paul writes, says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. The Greek word here for forgive is the word uh, charizomai. I'll have it on the screen, charizomai. It's the word forgive. It means to bestow favor unconditionally means I, I forgive, I'm bestowing favor without conditions. There's not a, I'm gonna forgive you if you get your act together. I'm gonna forgive you if you say sorry. I'm gonna forgive you if you pay me back. No, 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 no. I forgive you because God forgave me. Charizomai. What's interesting, if, if you go and study the root word, of charizomai, it's the word chariz. Chariz means grace. See, forgiveness can never exist without grace. Until you understand the grace you've received, you'll always struggle to forgive. See, forgiveness is tied to grace. We spoke about grace a couple of weeks ago. We spoke about grace is God choosing us, God loving us, God restoring us. See, when I come to God and I say, God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for giving me what I do not deserve, salvation, a new life, a relationship with you, forgiveness of my sin, removing of my sin, my guilt, my shame. It's your grace, God. It's your grace that did that. I could never earn a relationship with you. I could never be good enough to be forgiven by a holy God. But I don't have to because Jesus took my sins on the cross. Jesus is the manifestation of God's grace. If we wanna learn to forgive, we have to understand that we've received grace. And as we've received grace, we now extend it to others. I forgive you through the grace of God in my life. I forgive you through the love of God in my life. So what Paul says, in him we live, we move, and we have our being. See, Joseph could never forgive without the help of God. You can never forgive without the help of God. That's why we need him. We need his grace. Father, I thank you today. You know where we are today. For some of us in this room, some people we need to forgive. Some of us in this room, we're doing great, but God, maybe tomorrow is the day someone's gonna go at us, someone's gonna say something. You said in this world we'll face trials and tribulations, but we can't have joy because you've overcome. God, I pray that with this moment of worship, we just search our hearts, God. We just take a moment to lean into who you are. Would you just speak to us? In Jesus' name. When you walked in today, you probably got one of these cards. In a moment, we're just gonna spend a moment of worshiping and I want you to write down here if there's something with somebody today that you need to forgive. I want you to write it down. You notice the first one, I forgive myself. Because sometimes that's the hardest one to forgive. God, I made a bad decision. I did that. I'm so mad at myself. Why am I not living up as a Christian? I should be on fire for you, God. I should be loving you, reading my journal, doing all these things. God, I should be, I should be, and, but I'm struggling with this and struggling with that. And sometimes the one that we need to go to, God, God, please forgive me and help me to just forgive myself. Or maybe I forgive and write down a person's name. 
Maybe it's a spouse today. Maybe the reason your marriage is not flourishing is because you've allowed a root of bitterness to come into your marriage. There's something that happened, then you just got to say to God today, God, I'm just giving this to you. I'm bringing my marriage to you today. Would you help me to forgive? Would you take the heart of stone, turn it into a heart of flesh? Would you ignite love again for my spouse? Would you bless me in the land of my suffering? Would you make me fruitful? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a friend who betrayed you. During the song, I want you to write that down. And then after the song, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with these today. So let's take a moment. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, whatever you want to do. This is the time with the Lord right now.
may be seated. And uh, what we're going to do today is these cards, if you fill them out, when you walk out today, after church news, when you walk out, these are buckets we have outside, and I want you to take that and drop it in this bucket. And as you're doing that, this is the prayer for me, that you're letting it go. I'm letting it go, God. I'm leaving your house today, Sunday morning, and I'm, when I walk through those front doors, this is gone. I'm not picking it up anymore. I'm not going to pick it up. I'm leaving different this morning than when I came in. I'm not carrying that anymore. So the buckets are going to be out there, and I just want you to put it in. And as you do it, God, I'm not picking this up anymore. It's yours. Amen? Amen. Well, we're getting ready this morning to give as part of our worship. We're generous, our culture value. And so it's our moment to say to God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done in our life. We worship you with the first fruits of all we have. We worship him with our time, our talent, and our treasure. You know the ways to give. You can text to give. You can give online. There's envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you if you want to use that. As you head out, there's drop boxes. You can drop it there. Whatever the gift is today, I want to encourage you. It's worshiping God and it's partnering with what he's doing at Mountain Park. Father, we thank you today. Bless the seed that he's sown, the gift that he's given. Thank you today for providing all our needs. As we trust you today and we worship you with our finances, we thank you today that you're going to use them to touch lives, to, Lord, invite others to realize their role in God's story. So bless the seed today, the giver, the tithe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we get ready to give today, let's remain seated, take a quick look at church news and all the great things that are going on. Hey, Mountain Park fam. My name is Chris, and I serve on the Creative Worship Arts team. Our mission here at Mountain Park is to help people realize their role in God's story. Every role and every story matters to God and to us. Hey, are you new here? Welcome. We have a gift just for you. So if you're worshiping on site, be sure to stop by our new here start here tent as you exit if you didn't do so on your way in. Worshiping online? Simply text COMCARD to 77411 to fill out our digital communication card and let us know you'd like us to mail you your gift. Have you purchased a live journal yet? What are you waiting for? This amazing resource for $12 is designed to help you learn from God's Word using the SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer Method. To purchase your live journal or NPC swag, stop by the white marble table after service today. Here at Mountain Park, we are generous and serve to demonstrate God's love in practical ways. Next Saturday, October 15th, beginning at 9 a.m., we invite you to jump in with your time at Serve Saturday. This monthly outreach opportunity allows us to care for felt needs within our city. Head over to mountainpark.org forward slash events to learn more and register. Guess who's turning 35 on October 18th? We are Mount Park. Next Sunday, October 16th, we're going to be celebrating like it's 1987. Make plans to join us for our exciting services, refreshments, family fun, and photo ops afterwards. Trunk and Treat 2022 at Mountain Park Church will take place Saturday, October 29th from 5 to 8 p.m. As a faith family, this creative on-ramp enables us to love on kids and families within our community in a fun, entertaining, and safe way. But we need your help. Our candy drop-off is underway, and we are in need of 150,000 pieces of candy. Be generous and help us by donating a few bags and drop them off in the black bins in the lobby throughout the week or bring them next Sunday to our birthday celebration. Interested in hosting a trunk? Looking to serve as one of our amazing TNT volunteers? Or simply want to register you and your family? Head over to mountpark.org forward slash events. As your church family, we want to be able to pray for your specific needs. As you exit today, our prayer team is available at the prayer stations located in the back and would love to pray for you. We'll see you next Sunday at 9 and 10.30 a.m. for our 35th birthday celebration and the continuation of our series, Inside Story. Use your invite cards and encourage family and friends to join us. Have a dynamic week, fam.
Well, good morning, Mountain Park. We're so glad you're in the room. Would you stand on your feet? Those of you online, we're glad that you're here too. It's going to be a great day in the house of the Lord. There's joy. Come on, let's sing together. When all the sea is alive, you see my victory. And all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moon. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Anyone needs his love today? There's nothing to fear now, for I We're going to declare this together with one voice. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my head lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you.
through this morning you know the song that we sing and it's so beautiful because it says God I'm gonna praise you before I get my breakthrough I'm gonna praise you before I get the answer to the prayer you see Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says without faith you can't please God for he who comes to him must believe who he is and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, the song we sing, and he's saying, God, I'm coming to you, and I'm praising you before I get the answer, because I believe you are the God of the breakthrough. And I believe that as I seek you by faith and step in by faith, give a shout of praise by faith, clap by faith, speak by faith, believe by faith, God, that you're going to answer, because faith pleases you, God. You know, I want to read to you a very special praise report, because it's one that We've been praying for for uh, just over a, probably two to three months, and some of you will know the story, but we've been praying uh, for a couple that both got laid off on the same week, remember? Well, a couple of weeks, I said, the husband got opened the door and he got a job. Well, I just got a praise report card. The wife got a job too this week, and so God is faithful. He knows our needs, church, and when we come to Him as a church and faith, you know, that person said, please, I thank God, but also thank MPC for praying and agreeing. And so that's what we do. We agree together. There's so many cards I have here today. And a neighbor that's in, in ICU, a mom that's got back pain, and somebody that's got a surgery coming up. And uh, just there's so many cards here. Every card is a life that needs a breakthrough. And our staff prays over these on Tuesday morning in our staff meeting. These all go to our intercessors, our prayer team that pray for these every day. Uh, and uh, so th this is so important. Prayer is so important. Maybe you didn't fill a card out today, but there's a prayer on your heart. I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your heart, and I can see people doing that online. You can do that too right now. There's something on your heart right now, and you might be in another country, or another state. It doesn't matter. God God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. We're coming to Him in, in faith right now. We, we're believing right now. And so I want to ask you to stretch out your other hand towards me. And online, you can do this too. It's just agreement saying, you know what, I'm, I'm leaning in today. I'm agreeing with my brothers and sisters. We're coming by faith to God this morning and believing just as we heard a praise report that we're going to hear more breakthroughs, more praise reports, more answers, more healings and breakthroughs because God is the healer. He's the provider. He's a good God. So Lord, we come to you by faith today in this room and online, God. We're coming to you, God, because we need you. You're our provider. You're our healer. You're our shepherd. You're our king. You're our God. There is none like you. 
And so we're believing today, God, for, for successful surgeries, God. We're believing for provision. We're be believing for that court case that's going to happen over a, a foster kid. We pray for favor over that situation. For that neighbor who's in the ICU, God. I pray for every hand on every heart in this room and online. And we thank you today, God, that you know all our needs. You know what we're facing right now. You know the giants in our land, the challenges. But God, today we take this moment to declare, God, that you are the breakthrough God. We thank you today. We praise you for breakthroughs in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship together, church. Seated. Thank you for joining us this morning, and uh, so good to see you. I know we've got quite a lot of our family that are traveling for uh, fall break, and, uh, and it's always a good thing. I don't know about you, but I'm, it's just good to be able to travel again, right? I mean, just, just get out and enjoy creation, and, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's fun. And for those of you that have traveled and you've come back, it's good to see you back again in church. For those of you, I know we've got a bunch of our church family online. Thank you uh, for logging on and joining us today for Church Online. Safe travels as, as you head back after vacation, and uh, it's good to be with you. This is your first time at Mountain Park Church. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Please make sure after service that you head out to our New Year Start Year tent located just outside the front doors. We've got a little gift bag for you. It's just our way of saying thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, there's a team there that would answer uh, those questions, and they would just love to say hi 
to you and uh, so glad you're joining again online. Thank you for joining us for church online. A couple of uh, just quick announcements I have, just a few really important things going on. Uh, number one, if you didn't get a life journal yet, you can get it off to the service, uh, the marble table. I know we've uh, sold over 400 of these already. And so that's really exciting that people are in the Word of God. And so, you know, if you just do uh, just one day a week, it's 52 days that you would have been in the Word of God. I guarantee you that's, that might be more than last year. If you do two days a week, that's 104 days that you've been in the Word of God. And the journal takes you 15 minutes to do it. And so I want to encourage you to pick that up. Man shall not live by bread alone, is what Jesus said, but by the Word of God. And so uh, make sure you grab one of these after the service. Uh, hey, next weekend's a special weekend because it, it, it's our birthday. Yeah, it's our birthday. 35 years at Mountain Park. Mountain Park's 35 years old. And uh, how, how many of you have been here since the beginning? You've been here since the beginning at Mountain Park Church or over 30 years. Raise your hand. Over 30 years you've been at Mountain Park Church. I see Terry over there, and so uh, in the back, I see you. Anybody on this side? Okay, so we're going to, awesome. And so we're going to celebrate next week. We're going to have cake off to church. It's going to be fun. But more than just celebrating a birthday, we're going to celebrate the goodness of God. It's the faithfulness of God that has kept this church going and, and his hand over it. And so we're going to be celebrating God, and we've got some fun things planned. And I've got a fun message uh, Fun message for next week, and so you don't want to miss that. And so invite someone to church. It's going to be fun and a good way to get them to, to come and hear about the good news of God. So that is, uh, that's next weekend. And then uh, if you're a leader, uh, you want to be a leader, you're uh, on a, a, a servant team, you represent Mountain Park, uh, an outreach, whatever that is, we have Lead Saturday coming up. That's October the 22nd. Uh, it goes, uh, I believe it goes from 8.30, I believe, till uh, 9, 9 to 1.30, and we need you to register. We got lunch provided for you, and you might say, well, what is this all about? We're going to talk about what leadership looks like at Mountain Park. We're then going to do leadership training, and then we're going to talk about our statement of faith and a whole bunch of other fun things, and so it's just going to be a great, great time. We're so excited. We spoke in our DNA series about, yet yeah, Mountain Park, we want disciples who make disciples, leaders over leaders, and so we're beginning to elevate that here at Mountain Park Church, and so if you're a leader, so important that you make this weekend, there is child care for you as well. And then something I'm, I'm excited about, so uh, for couples, uh, you want to mark your calendar for this, November 4th and 5th is our Art of Marriage weekend, our little mini conference, and uh, this, is, this is just great. I've done, I've, I've been a part of this at a few different churches, uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, people say, well, our marriage is not in a mess. Well, you know what? My car needs an oil change. And it's, my car's not in a mess, but it needs an oil change, right? Because if it doesn't get an oil change, it's going to be in a mess. And so sometimes, you know what? Our marriages just need an oil change. This is a great, great weekend where you're going to learn about, you know, communication skills. You're going to learn about the definition of marriage. I really believe it's going to help you. In fact, the last time I did this as a church in Chicago with the, with the marriage team, and by the way, we have a great marriage ministry here at Mountain Park. I love it. And all the leaders. Yep. But uh, I, I did this with a couple that had been married for 53 years. And I'm kind of like, why would you guys show up? I mean, you should be writing the book on marriage, right? 53 years. I mean, you got the gold. What's next? Platinum or, you know, or titanium? I don't know what the next is. But I'm like, you should write a book. And you know what's amazing is they, they love the course. In fact, they sent me a handwritten card of saying, you've just helped our marriage go to the next level. I'm like, there is a next level for when you get to 50. But they were just so blessed by this. And they said, we learned so much. And they didn't have marriage issues. They loved each other. And so this course is for everyone. And so I want to encourage you, you need to register online after the service. The Marriage Mondays team will be over uh, at the group up jumping area. If you go to the doors to the left there, and they'll answer any questions you have. But really excited for this weekend. We have childcare, we have meals, it's all included uh, in the cost. And so, hey, good way to get it, just ramp up your marriage. Uh, and uh, so we'll talk more about that a little later. Well, today I'm continuing our series, uh, Inside Story with part two. And Alyssa kicked us off last week talking about trusting God and Anna in the Bible. And, and today I'm going to talk about maybe a little bit of a heavier topic, but I think it's a great topic. I'm going to talk today about the power of forgiveness. Power of forgiveness. And we're going to look at one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Joseph. Joseph. 
You know, life is so much about relationships. We interact with people all the time. And the reality is because we're interacting with people and, and relationships, we're going to go through disappointments. We're going to go through betrayals. We're going to go through rejection. We're going to go through people slandering and gossiping about us. We, we, that, that's life. You know, if you think, well, you know what, I'm just going to go find a cave, you know, up in the Rockies, and I don't have to deal with anybody, that's impossible because you're going to need to get food. You're going to have to interact with somebody. Even the Uber driver, when he comes up to that cave, you know, you might say, drop me. You're going to see somebody. There's interaction. That's, that's life. We're going to interact with people. And sometimes, you know what, we're going to be hurt. We're going to be disappointed. But how do we deal with that? You know, Joseph is an interesting man in the Bible. His story begins in Genesis chapter 37. And Joseph, uh, he's a young man, and he's his, his dad's favorite boy, and his dad makes him a robe with, with many colors. And, and you know, he, the, the brothers knew that the dad loved him, and he was the favorite. And Joseph has a dream, and it's a dream that God gave him. And in the dream, uh, 11 bundles of grain bowed down. So 10 bundles bowed down to one. And he goes to his brothers and says, hey, guys, I had a dream. And they're like, what was the dream? And he said, the, the dream was this. You all going to bow down to me. I didn't know that was a small move. <laughs> Tell your bigger brothers, hey, you all going to bow down to me. And then he has a second dream. He dreamed that he just dreamed the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, again, the 11 brothers, they all bowed down to him. And so he goes to his dad. He says, Dad, I had a dream. He says, what's your dream? I dreamed that you, Mom, and my 11 brothers are going to bow down to me. You know what? Side note. Be careful who you share your dreams to. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be excited. In fact, the book of Habakkuk says, write your dreams down, your visions down, and give them to people that can run with you, not run against you. But Joseph shares his dream, and guess what? His brothers weren't excited. They weren't high-fiving each other like, "Woo, this is awesome. We love Joseph. Joseph, Joseph, he's the coolest. They would know. They began to think, how do we kill him? How do we remove him? We're done with him. He struts around in his robe and, and his dad's favorite, and so they come up with a plan to kill him. But one of the brothers say, no, 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 let's not kill him. And they make a decision to sell him as a slave. Now think about that. Think if you were Joseph. First time your brother's throwing you in a pit, they want to kill you. Your own flesh and blood, your own family wants to kill you. Then they sell you as a slave. And as, as you're going off as a slave, they're jumping up, high five. We got rid of the problem. Our life is great. And, and, and you literally, you, you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. Your own family. Your dad who loves you, you might never see him again. You don't know. You're sold as a slave. You're going into Egypt, a foreign land. Think about the pain that Joseph must have felt in that moment, the disappointment. And then he, he ends up in the house of Potiphar, a wealthy man, and, and, and he begins to serve there, and God's favor is on Joseph's life, and God begins to, 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 to move in, in Joseph, and Joseph's leading, and everything he's touching is turning to gold. Everything he's doing is prospering, and Potiphar just empowers him and makes him like the lead in his house, the most powerful man under him in his house. Joseph's running everything. I mean, life is, is going great. And then Joseph starts getting text messages from Potiphar's wife. Joseph, Joseph, you're so fine. You're so fine, you should be mine. You know, she's like, you know, just, she's starting to hit on him. And Joseph's like, stay away from me, woman. But one day he's alone in the house with her. And she's like, come on, Joseph, why don't you just sleep with me? I mean, you're so good looking. I've been dreaming about you. And, and so, and what does Joseph do? He doesn't stay and entertain. He runs. He runs because he wants to please God. Come on, there's some things in life you just got to run from. There's some things you're like, well, I'm strong enough to face it. No, Joseph ran. He, was, he ran. He got out of, you got to run. And what does she do? She accuses him of rape. She falsely accuses him of rape. And he ends up in a prison cell. Think about it. My brothers betrayed me, tried to kill me, sold me off as a slave, just owned me. I'm in Potiphar's house. I'm doing the right thing. I'm making this guy money. I'm making him successful. I, I, everything is running smooth and great. And now he, he accuses me of raping his wife and I'm in prison. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, betrayal, disappointment. And then he's in prison and God's favor is on his life. And the warden raises him up to basically run the prison. He's doing so good. And one day he meets a, a baker and a cupbearer. The baker for Pharaoh and the cupbearer. 
And these guys have a dream, and they come, and they say, we have a dream, and, we're, and what does Joseph do? He, he has an interpretation, and he shares the interpretation, basically says to the baker, hey, in three days, you're going to be set free, and then you're going to be executed. And to the cupbearer, he says, in three days, you're going to be restored to the cupbearer for Pharaoh. And he says, and he says to the cupbearer, hey, you know, just, just remember me. And the cupbearer is like, bro, I've got you. You hooked me up. When I'm in front of Pharaoh, I'm going to tell him all about you, Joseph. We're going to get you out of prison. You know, I'm your BFF. I got you. And what happens? The baker gets executed. The cupbearer in three days is before Pharaoh, serving him again his cup. And does the cupbearer remember Pharaoh? I mean, Joseph? No, the cupbearer forgets about him. He's just living his dream. He's just happy. I'm out of prison. And two years later, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. He gets all his magicians, his wise men in. No one can interpret the dream. And Pharaoh is just sitting there. And the cupbearer sees him. And he goes, I think, ah, Joseph. I don't know if Joseph, it's two years. Joseph's still alive. I don't know. Well, it says, I know somebody. And they, what happens? They bring Joseph before Pharaoh. Now, if I was Joseph walking into Pharaoh and I saw the cupbearer, I would have just gone over and like handled business somebody. I would have just dealt with that, man. I'm like, what happened? And he interprets the dream, and what does Pharaoh do? He takes off his signet ring, and he makes him the prime minister of Egypt, second most powerful man. He, why? Because Pharaoh saw God's hand on Joseph's life. And Joseph says to Pharaoh in his dream, he said, there's going to be seven years of just the crops and the harvest is going to be amazing. It's like we're just feasting. And he says, but then there's going to be seven years of drought that will come. And so what do we need to do? We need to prepare. We need to store up food for the famine. And so the famine comes, and two years into the famine, Joseph's dad sends the brothers to Egypt because he hears there's food in Egypt. And the brothers end up coming before Joseph. They don't know it's Joseph. They don't recognize it's Joseph. They just know they have an audience with the second most powerful man the prime minister of Egypt. We're going to pick the passage up today in Genesis chapter 45, in verse 4. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, we, I wish, uh, can you hear the drum? Now, what's going to happen? Imagine being the brothers, the prime minister, second most powerful man, says, come a little closer to me. And they're probably like knuckling each other like, we got favor, man. He's going to hook us up. He wants us to come in. He wants to be our friend. We got favor. They get close. They lean in. They don't recognize it's Joseph. And then Joseph comes and says, I'm your brother. <laughs> da -da -da -da. I mean, what a moment for Joseph to say, vengeance is mine, not yours, God. Vengeance is mine, says Joseph. I'm going to handle it. You guys, you try to kill me. You sold me. I was accused of rape. I was in prison. You know how bad prison food is? You know how hard I'm headed? People talking about me slandering. And here I am. I have the power. I'm going to deal with you guys right now. But he doesn't. Look what he says in verse 5. And now do not be distressed. Why? Because they were pretty stressed. And do not be angry. Why? Because they're angry with each other. It's your fault. Your fault. Joseph, it's him. They're blaming and shaming. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Why? Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, they will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to persevere for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Wow. Do you see what he just said? He doesn't say, well, you know what, guys? You guys put me through all of this, but you're so lucky because you know what? I got through this. I made it on my own. I was all by myself. Don't want to be. I was, but I am. And you know what? I have the power to save you right now. He doesn't do that. He says what? God. God made me go through this. God sent me through this. And you know why God did that? So that I could save you. Dad. Mom. Israel. In the midst of the pain and the suffering, Joseph 
gives glory to God in verse 8. And so then it was, he says to them, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of Egypt. How could Joseph get to this place in the midst of facing the very ones that tried to kill him, that sold him as a slave, that degraded, that took his robe off him? How could he stand in front of them in that moment and not hold any grudges or unforgiveness? How could he not have them put to death or put in prison? I mean, if there's anybody that had a right to be vindictive in that moment, it's Joseph. Anybody had a right to be angry? I mean, think about the times of, you know, being, being carted away and what was going through his mind as a slave and in part of his house as a slave and, and then being accused of rape and then being in prison and all this pain and, and thinking back to the day where you used to be with your dad who loved you and your robe and life was great. You could do what you wanted, but now you're in prison. Think about those things going through his mind and as he stands before them, he says this. He says, God has done this so that I could save you. What was Joseph's secret? How could he deal with that betrayal, that pain, the lies, the gossip, the accusations, the friends that made promises but never came through? How could he deal with that? You see, the secret to Joseph, the secret to him dealing with unforgiveness is found in one thing. Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. Joseph trusted in the sovereignty of God. It was God who sent me through this. He didn't have excuses. He didn't blame. It was God who sent me through this that I could save you. Well, in a sense, you would read this passage and say, you know what? For Joseph, there must have been closure right here. I mean, closure. His brothers are standing before him. Joseph, closure. You finally can let it go. You finally can let it release. But you know what? The reality is that Joseph forgave his brothers way before they stood in front of him. It wasn't closure for Joseph. In fact, if you go a couple of chapters back in in Genesis chapter 41, in verse 50, before the years of famine came. So in a sense, if you do the math, before the years of famine came, that's, that's seven years before. Joseph, two sons were born to Joseph, Basineth, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh, and he said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Joseph stops. His first son, Manasseh, he names, God has made me forget all of my suffering and the pain of my household, my family. I love that. He didn't go get counseling. He didn't do, God has made me forget. That word forget, if you study it in the Hebrew, literally means you sent it away never to return. It literally means forgive. I have forgive, I've forgiven, but to the extent that I've let it go and it'll never come back to haunt me. And I love that because his God has made me forget. The second son, let's look at his name. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. I love that. The first son, Manasseh, I trust you, sovereign God. I trust you, sovereign God means you're in control. Sovereign God means I don't understand why this is going on in my world, why people have deceived me and betrayed me, why people have said things, why they robbed me, why they stole. I don't know, but God, you're still sovereign. You're still in control. You still have a plan for my life, God. You, you're the one, God, that I come to. And so what is Joseph saying? God, I need you. I grab onto you. And as he grabbed onto God, what happened in his life is he could let that forgiveness go, that unforgiveness. He could let that unforgiveness go. Never to, God, you have made me forget. And then his second son, he names Ephraim. Ephraim means what? God, you have now blessed me in the land of my suffering. 
Joseph stepped into the blessing and favor of God. Why? Because he trusted God and he could give God that unforgiveness and he knew in his heart, God, you've got it. You're in control. It doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to you. I trust you, God. And because he could forget blessing. You see, so many of us want the blessing of God, but we don't want to forgive people. In Joseph's life, forgiveness opened the door to blessing. Joseph needed God. God has brought me through this. God has made me forget. God has made me fruitful. The secret of Joseph forgiving his brothers was found in Joseph trusting the sovereignty. God, you're on the throne. No matter what people do to me, you're still on the throne. No matter what people do to me, you're still in control. Why is holding on to unforgiveness so, so dangerous? Why is it so damaging? I want to give you three things about unforgiveness. Number one, unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness to grow in our hearts. Unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness to grow in our life. See, when we hold on to this unforgiveness, it begins to, we begin to have a root planted in our heart. And you know what a root does? It produces a tree. And you know what a tree does? It produces fruit. Fruits of, now we're critical of everybody. Now we wanna know when people come into our lives, what's their MO? What's the motive? What are they looking for? Are they gonna use me? We look negative. We can't see the good in others. All we see is negative, negative. And we're expecting them to hurt us. We walk around, I know they're gonna hurt me. I know they're gonna hurt me. Watch, it's coming. We operate out of fear and not out of faith. Why? Because there's a root of fitness. Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 14 to 15 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one can see God. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. He's, the right of Hebrews is saying, don't miss out. Keep your eyes, keep your heart focused on the grace that you've received from God. We spoke about that a few weeks ago. This God's grace is what? God giving us what we don't deserve. Well, what did he give us? Love, forgiveness, peace, his presence in our life, the promise of eternity, his power and strength, his word living inside of us. Forgive Forgiveness of our sins. We can take away the old and have a new life in him. That's the grace of God. And Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the grace of God. He says, says, don't miss. The writer of Hebrews says, don't miss what you've received, this grace. And, And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. The writer of Hebrews saying, come on, focus on the grace that you've received. Focus on who gave you the grace, God. And don't let unforgiveness take root in your heart. One of my favorite verses, Proverbs chapter 4, 23. Guard your heart above all else in your life. Why? Because it determines the direction and the course of your life. You see, if you don't guard your heart, unforgiveness will come. People are gonna hurt you. Hurt people hurt people. That's life. But if you let that root get in, it's gonna produce fruit. It's gonna hold you back. Unforgiveness allows a root of bitterness to grow in our hearts. Number two, unforgiveness opens the door to the enemy in our lives. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 10 and 11, Paul says, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes. And Paul's writing to the Corinth church because there's someone that has sinned in that church and caused so much pain and anger. And the church in Corinth is mad and this unforgiveness, how could he? And what does Paul, the father of the church say? He says, I, Paul, have forgiven him. You need to forgive him because if we as a church don't know how to forgive others, guess what's happening? We're opening a door for the enemy to come in. He's gonna come in. He's looking for a way to come into your life. And one of the ways is he will get your heart to have unforgiveness towards other Christians, to your spouse, to your kid, to your parents, to your colleagues, to your friends. Unforgiveness opens the door. Number three, and this is the most important to me, unforgiveness grieves the spirit of God. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30, Paul writes says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. He's, Paul's writing here saying, come on, guard your heart. 
Don't, don't forget that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't dwell in a building. When, when you ask Jesus into your life, guess what? Your sins are forgiven. It's removed as far as the east is from the west. You now have become righteous. The righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, what he did on the cross. And the Bible says that you are now the temple. And the spirit of God is in your life. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. I need to go. I need to go to be at the Father wide so that I can send the Holy Spirit in your life, the presence of God in your life. And so that's why when you say something bad about someone out of anger or unforgiveness, you say something mean, you feel like, ooh, that didn't feel good. What was that, ooh, that didn't feel good? You know what that was? That was you grieving the Holy Spirit because he's convicting you. Come on, don't talk that way. Don't think that way. Don't say those things. Don't act that way towards that brother or that sister. Don't act that way to your spouse. Don't act that way to your kid. That's, that's, don't let that root of bitterness get in your heart. Don't open the door. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we need the Spirit of God in our lives. So what does forgiveness look like? I want to give you three things today. Three things today. Number one, forgiveness is releasing your resentment towards your offender. Saying, God, that person that hurt me, I'm bringing them to you. Joseph said, Manasseh, God has made me forgive. What was Joseph doing? Joseph had to take his, his dad. Why did dad not come and look for me? I know that dad knew I wasn't dead. He had that feeling inside. He must have had that feeling. My boy's not dead. My brothers betrayed me and tried to kill me and sold me off. What did he do? He brought all of that to God, your sovereign. I'm choosing that. I'm giving this to you. You see, when we begin to release the resentment, they violated, they cheated, they stole, they betrayed, they hurt. That word was ugly. What they did behind my back. God. That, that pain I'm feeling, I'm giving it to you. Well, Pastor Charlton, I feel like they need to get theirs. Well, you know what? Give them to God. Take them off your hook, put them onto his. God, whatever you're gonna do, you're gonna work it out. But you know what? It's really hard to pray for your enemy when you haven't given your enemy to God. It's very hard to turn the other cheek when you haven't given them to God. We stop and say, God, I'm coming to your cross because it's the place where I'm forgiven. And as you've forgiven me, help me to forgive them. Help me to take that pain Romans chapter 12, 17, do not repay evil anyone, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. That unforgiveness, that pain, that hurt, that disappointment, give it to God because he saw it and he's ready to take it out of your life. Don't let that root get into your heart. God, I'm not gonna respond. I'm gonna change what I say about them. I'm gonna change the way I think about them. Do they deserve it? Probably not. But yes, the good news, I didn't deserve your love and forgiveness, yet you gave it to me. Number two, release your rights regarding the offense. Release the resentment towards that person. Now release the rights. God, I'm given the right, the right for me to be angry, the right for me to be disappointed, the right for me to, to, to you know, not see them and to avoid them. I'm giving up the rights to, do, Lord, Lord, I'm giving up all those rights to you. I'm giving the control to you, God. I didn't just give the pain to you, the disappointment to you, the situation to you. I'm giving the control to you. I don't have a right to judge them. Only you do, God. Only you do. And so, God, I'm, I'm giving up the right, God. Proverbs 17, verse 9, whoever fosters love covers an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So I release the resentment. I re release the rights to judge them. I give that all to God who's sovereign. Number three, forgiveness is reflecting the character of Christ. 
Why do I forgive them? Because he forgave me. He forgave me. I didn't deserve it. I couldn't earn God's forgiveness. I don't deserve his forgiveness. I could never be spiritual enough, good enough. I still have a flesh. But I'm so glad that God, holy God in heaven, made a way for me, a sinner, to be forgiven. That one day when I stand before him and the enemy says, Charlton sinned and he did that and that, I did, Jesus will step up and say, I paid the price. I paid the price for his forgiveness. We have received so much in God's grace. Let's release it to others. God, I wanna release the resentment. God, you saw what I went through, you know, but now I'm giving up the control. I'm releasing the rights to you. Make me like Joseph, forget, forgive. Make me fruitful, turn this, around, the story around for me. Teach me to walk in the new life you have for me, in the freedom and the joy. I wanna to close today with Ephesians chapter four, verse 32. Paul says this, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. There's an interesting word in this passage, the word, the Greek word for forgive is charizomai, charizomai. Said that pretty good, charizomai. I practice that a lot, church. Charizomai, it means to forgive, to bestow favor unconditionally. See, when you forgive, you're not putting expectations on that person. You're not putting on conditions. You're saying, as Christ forgave me unconditionally, I'll now extend this charizomai, forgiveness. Might never be, there might never be reconciliation. Re forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is you setting yourself free. Saying, God, I don't wanna carry this anymore. I don't know why I had to go through this. Don't know why I had to experience that. Don't know why I'm in this season right now. Maybe in your marriage, there's unforgiveness. God, I don't know why we're in this place, but here's what I do know. You're sovereign. Forgive me for holding on to unforgiveness. Forgive me for allowing a root of bitterness. Forgive me for opening the door to the enemy. Today, forgive me and let, let your charizomai, your forgiveness of me, flow through me to that person. What's interesting is, we can put that up again, the word charizomai, the root word of charizomai is the word chariz. The word chariz means grace. See, you can't forgive till you've received his grace. Forgiveness and grace are tied together. There's some of you today that are simply, God, wash me in your grace. As you wash me in my grace, in your grace, God, I can lay that down, that hurt, that pain, that disappointment, and I can enter into your freedom that you have for me. As you walked in today, you got a card, and uh, it says here, I will forgive myself. Sometimes the person we need to forgive the most is ourselves. And sometimes that's the hardest one to forgive. God, why'd I do that? Why'd I make that decision? Why'd I act that way? Why was I selfish? Why did I say that? Or maybe this, I need to forgive. So there's someone you need to forgive. And as we take a moment to worship, and I'm gonna ask you for the next few minutes, you don't wanna leave. The, we'll make it in time for the game. But there's some of you today, I want you to leave this place better than what you came in. And the thing that's holding you back is unforgiveness. And so I want you to take this as the team leads us in a worship song. And I just believe God's presence is gonna minister. And I want you to write down that person, write down that situation. And then I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do with this afterwards. So let's take this moment to worship God.
be seated and uh, I'm not going to tell you in life there's been many moments in my journey where I've experienced pain disappointment heartache pastors that said they were close to me that weren't but you know what I've realized that's life it's life when God is in control of your life you don't have to fear anyone or anything Jesus said that he came to set us free, he came to give us life. Book of Isaiah says that by his stripes, we're healed. You don't have to live with the pain 
the disappointment. There's hope. And that hope is Jesus. And he wants you to be like Joseph. God has made me forget. God has made me fruitful. He wants to make you fruitful today. Fruitful in your walk with him. Fruitful in the way you see yourself. Fruitful in your marriage. Fruitful in your singleness. Fruitfulness as a parent. Fruitful in your relationships. But it starts with God, your sovereign. You got it. We ask you to fill out these cards and what I want you to do is after service, after church news, because I know you're all gonna stay for church news, right? Amen, amen, amen. After church news, when you walk out, we've got these buckets out there and I want you to take this and I want you to go and just drop it in. And as you're dropping it in, God, I'm giving this to you and I'm not gonna pick it up anymore. I'm not gonna carry it anymore. It's yours. And as you do that today, I'm believing that you're gonna leave this place different than when you came in. You're gonna be a lot lighter, a lot lighter because he's got it and he's gonna work it out for you. Let's trust our God, church, amen? Amen. Hey, as we get ready to give, you know the ways to give. You can text to give. There's giving envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you if you want to and drop boxes at the back. You can give online, whatever way that you choose to give. Giving is one of the ways we worship God. Here at Mountain Park, we believe we are generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure. So Father, as we give today, we're giving back to you out of worship, the tithe, the offering. We thank you today that you're gonna use it to invite others to realize their role in your story. So bless the seed, the gift that is given in Jesus' name. As we get ready to give today, Let's take a look at church news and all the great things that are coming up. Hey, Mountain Park fam. My name is Chris and I serve on the Creative Worship Arts team. Our mission here at Mountain Park is to help people realize their role in God's story. Every role and every story matters to God and to us. Hey, are you new here? Welcome. We have a gift just for you. So if you're worshiping on site, be sure to stop by our new here, start here tent as you exit if you didn't do so on your way in. Worshiping online? Simply text COMCAR to 77411 to fill out our digital communication card and let us know you'd like us to mail you your gift. Have you purchased a life journal yet? What are you waiting for? This amazing resource for $12 is designed to help you learn from God's Word using the SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer Method. To purchase your life journal or NPC swag, stop by the white marble table after service today. Here at Mountain Park, we are generous and serve to demonstrate God's love in practical ways. Next Saturday, October 15th, beginning at 9 a.m., we invite you to jump in with your time at Serve Saturday. This monthly outreach opportunity allows us to care for felt needs within our city. Head over to mountainpark.org forward slash events to learn more and register. Guess who's turning 35 on October 18th? We are Mount Park. Next Sunday, October 16th, we're going to be celebrating like it's 1987. Make plans to join us for our exciting services, refreshments, family fun, and photo ops afterwards. Trunk and Treat 2022 at Mountain Park Church will take place Saturday, October 29th from 5 to 8 p.m. As a faith family, this creative on-ramp enables us to love on kids and families within our community in a fun, entertaining, and safe way. But we need your help. Our candy drop-off is underway and we are in need of 150,000 pieces of candy. Be generous and help us by donating a few bags and drop them off in the black bins in the lobby throughout the week or bring them next Sunday to our birthday celebration. Interested in hosting a trunk? Looking to serve as one of our amazing TNT volunteers? Or simply want to register you and your family? Head over to mountpark.org forward slash events. As your church family, we want to be able to pray for your specific needs. As you exit today, our prayer team is available at the prayer stations located in the back and would love to pray for you. We'll see you next Sunday at 9 and 10.30 a.m. for our 35th birthday celebration and the continuation of our series, Inside Story. Use your invite cards and encourage family and friends to join us. Have a dynamic week, fam.